Straight ahead on CCX News, a local lawmaker introduces a bill to legalize recreational marijuana, why he supports it and what others are saying about it. Then a closer look at elementary school recess and a legislative proposal that requires districts to have a recess policy. And later, why this elementary school classroom doubled as a barber shop. CCX News starts right now. Hello everyone and thanks for joining us. It is controversial and concerning for some. A local state lawmaker wants to legalize marijuana in Minnesota. DFL representative John Applebaum, who represents portions of Plymouth and Minnetonka, is set to introduce a bill for the recreational use of marijuana. Reporter Sonia Goins joins us with more. Sonia? Mike and Alex, Representative John Applebaum plans to officially introduce the bill on Thursday. He says the world is changing and Minnesotans are developing different attitudes when it comes to marijuana. I think that legislators would be keen to change their positions because the public is heavily in support of this issue and it's only a matter of time. Under Applebaum's plan, recreational marijuana would be regulated in the same fashion to alcohol. Only people older than 21 would be able to purchase or possess the product. Residents would also be allowed to buy up to one ounce of weed for personal use. And folks would also be able to grow up to six plants at a time. Applebaum says the marijuana business could help the economy soar high. People are gonna use marijuana anyway. It's proven to be non-dangerous, and so in Minnesota, we have an opportunity to capitalize on it, to regulate it, to tax it, and we can use those revenues to benefit our public schools. Now, Applebaum says legalizing weed would improve the criminal justice system by, by allowing cops to spend more time on serious crimes. However, several law enforcement agencies are not buying that theory. Plymouth, uh, Plymouth Police Chief Mike Goldstein says he's concerned and he disagrees with that statement, but he wants to reserve further comment until he sees the bill. Governor Mark Dayton also weighed in on the issue. He opposes the idea. Mike and Alex, currently eight states and the District of Columbia have approved recreational use for marijuana. All right, thanks a lot, Sonia. Meantime, a Plymouth lawmaker is behind legislation to offer tax incentives to get more kids enrolled in pre-kindergarten. Republican Sarah Anderson is sponsoring legislation that would provide tax credits equal to 75% of the amount paid for a qualifying child enrolled in a pre-K program. The bill has bipartisan support. However, there are accountability concerns given the wide range of pre-K options, which include everything from independent daycares to district-run preschools. For generations, recess has been considered by many students in elementary school as their favorite part of the day. But some parents have argued that their kids are getting less time for recess than when they were kids. As Delane Cleveland reports, a Minneapolis lawmaker now wants school districts to have a recess policy. When you're in the first grade, few things in life are more enjoyable than spending some time outside for recess. The students burn off energy, and in the process, they're learning valuable life lessons. And when they're out on the playground, they are interacting with each other. They're learning how to deal with conflict. They're making friends. They're socializing. There's so many pieces that they're learning how to be a citizen. Patrick Smith is the principal of Basswood Elementary. He says that at this school, students have recess for a total of 30 minutes a day. But that's not the case for other districts. It's a variety. You, you'll see some districts will have 15 to 20 minutes of recess time. Um, I was talking to another principal from another district, and they have 35 minutes for recess and lunch combined. It's a stat that caught the attention of DFL representative Jim Davney of Minneapolis. Common sense tells us little kids need to get their wiggles out. To help ensure that students in kindergarten through fifth grade get in their recess time, He's introduced a bill that would require school districts to have a policy on the total number of minutes of recess each day. What's in that policy uh, and all of that, that's decided at the local level. We just say you need to have a policy. You need to be thinking about kids in recess. At Basswood, staff members are certainly in favor of recess but not so much on the idea of the state mandating it. I think maybe recommendations might be a better way to approach it, saying this is what we recommend, and then giving some control locally as a school board to decide what we're able to do. In Maple Grove, Delaney Cleveland, CCX News. 
In response to the proposed legislation, the spokesperson for the Osseo Area School District said, quote, requiring districts to adopt a policy specifying the number of minutes for K-5 recess is an example of a state mandate that would reduce local control. The bill may also be based on an inaccurate assumption that recess is the only way that schools provide daily physical activity for students. If you think it's too early to start thinking about next school year, think again, especially, especially if you have a three or four year old ready for preschool. And what is that picture? Yo-yo. Yo-yo. Why is for yo-yo? Great job. Now is the time to register your child for free preschool in the Anoka Hennepin School District. Specifically, if you're within the attendance boundaries of Evergreen Park Elementary in Brooklyn Center or Monroe Elementary in Brooklyn Park, they have 80 spots open for any child that turns four years old on or before September 1st. The preschool program includes transportation and a meal, and it's a great way to get your child ready for kindergarten. Yes. That's the goal is when they hit elementary school, they understand, first of all, how school works. They know how to take care of their own needs. They know how to participate in a class. We also have a really ex excellent curriculum in reading and writing and mathematics and music. There is a free preschool information night coming up this Thursday night at 6.30 at the Noka Hennepin Educational Service Center in Anoka. And you can visit the district's website for more information. The state of the city in Golden Valley is pretty straightforward, a monumental year for construction, in particular apartment and townhome construction. According to Golden Valley City Manager Tim Craigshank, four residential projects began in 2016 and two more are in the pipeline for 2017. The ones underway include the Hello Apartments off Highway 55 and 169, Laurel Ponds, a townhome project at Laurel and Pennsylvania Avenues, Liberty Crossing, which will include apartments and townhomes at the southeast corner of Winnetka Avenue and Medicine Lake Road, and Central Park West apartments at the southwest corner of I-394 and Highway 100. Projects in the works for 2017 include the Tello Apartments, which used to be called the 394 Apartments at the northwest corner of I-394 and Highway 100, and the Xenia Apartments at Xenia and Golden Hills Drive. Other big projects for Golden Valley in 2017 include construction of the new $18 million Brookview Community Center and completion of the Douglas Drive reconstruction project. Meanwhile, big improvements are planned for city baseball fields in Golden Valley. Isaacson Park, named after the late Dave Isaacson, a longtime youth baseball coach, was awarded a $100,000 grant through the Hennepin County Youth Sports Program. The, the money will help pay to replace dugouts, add new field lights, and replace all the spectator bleachers. And a significant funding development for the Botno Light Rail Project. The Hennepin County Board has approved $50 million to fund engineering costs. The county's Transit Improvement Board, which is made up of representatives from five metro area counties, is expected to fund the remaining $76 million required for the engineering phase. The total cost of the project is $1.5 billion, with 49% of it expected to be funded by the federal government. Coming up, Valentine's Day flower tips to help you save money. And then later in sports, the Maranatha Christian Academy girls basketball team shoots for a conference title. But first, warming up, but still chilly on Thursday. Temperatures stay in the teens. We'll be right back. All right, men out there, listen up. Valentine's Day is less than a week away. We could always use a reminder. Yeah. Better than forgetting, right? <laughs> right. But if you want to save money when buying some flowers this year, time is of the essence. Reporter Shannon Slatton explains why you should shop or order now in today's Money Savers. It's what? A, a week away now. Perhaps your local florist knows the countdown to Valentine's Day better than just about anyone else. Yeah, this is basically the calm before the storm. Frank Molander knows that last minute rush all too well. Valentine's Day is kind of a, a guy holiday and um, a lot of people 
will late, wait to the last minute to place orders for delivery. He hires extra drivers and extra staff to work extra hours for a day when flowers are in high demand. Come Tuesday morning, this will be filled with arrangements ready to go out front. When it comes to flowers for your Valentine, the red rose rules the day. But perhaps what people don't realize. This is the most expensive time of year to grow a rose. Um, greenhouses have to be heated. Um, our days are short. Plus, there's high demand and that drives up the price. To be a smart consumer, consider in-season flowers. We've got local tulips, for example, that we could do a dozen in a vase for probably a third of the cost of a dozen roses. Or consider the lilies as the second most popular Valentine flower. We try very much to have like at least one flower that's open. Bolander recommends ordering early, talking about your budget and what you can do to make your gift special. We want our customers to walk out the door feeling like that they have the perfect Valentine gift. Last minute shoppers will have a more limited selection and they will likely pay more than they intended. But here Bolander says they will have something to take Home. We'll be working, you know, probably 14, 16 hour days um, over the weekend so that we can be ready for everybody. In Golden Valley, Shannon Slatten, CCX News. And something to consider when shopping online for flowers, check the reviews before ordering and see how the website figures in the delivery charge. Well, coming up, a group of elementary students get a new look for good behavior. But first, Maple Grove overwhelms Wyzetta in the team's regular season finale in girls hockey. John Jacobson has the highlights coming up next in sports. I'm John Jacobson with sports. With the girls hockey playoffs about to face off, local teams are finishing up the regular season. Wyzetta on a home ice to take on third ranked Maple Grove. Maple Grove's Taylor Wente to Maya Martinez. She stopped, but Wente buries the rebound for a 2 0 Crimson lead. Later in the first period, the defenders collide and Wente takes advantage, scoring on the breakaway for a 3 0 Crimson lead. Paige Casibo capitalizes on a Trojans turnover to score in the final minute of the period, and it's 4-0 Crimson after one. Second period, Tina Campa turns sharply to score in close. Maple Grove's lead grows to 6 to nothing. Then on a three-on-one rush, Crimson Wente will pass it to Martinez for the goal, and it's all Maple Grove. They lead 8-0 after two. Wyzetta does get one in in the third. Casey Johnson scores. Maple Grove ends the regular season with 20 wins after an 8-1 victory. The Brack boys basketball team had its four-game winning streak snapped Saturday in a close loss to a Holy Family. The Mustangs knew getting back into the win column wouldn't be easy Tuesday against the top-ranked team in Class 2A, Minnehaha Academy. Good start for Breck. They swing it around, and Kerwin Walton buries a three for a quick 7-0 Mustangs lead. Minnehaha storms back. Jalen Suggs keeps the defender on his hip, gets to the basket for two, plus a foul. 14-11 Red Hawks. Suggs leads the balance attack with 16 points. Lorenzo Smith penetrates and kicks it to Caden Johnson. His shot rattles around and drops. Johnson scores 14 for the Red Hawks. They lead by eight. They force a turnover here, and Johnson gets control of his dribble to score on the acrobatic layup. Miniha takes a 37-23 lead into the locker room at halftime. Second half, Jose Williamson gets it inside to Giovanni Bickham for the power move of the hoop. The lead is 16 for Minnehaha. Breck has some good young talent. Freshman Walton hits the mid-range shot on his way to a 25-point game for the Mustangs. But the Red Hawks have too much firepower. They pull away to win at 81-56 over Breck. In girls basketball, Maranatha Christian Academy hosted Legacy Christian in an MCAA conference game. Kennedy Burquist with the steal, and then the pass ahead to Kylie Post for the layup. Post with 12 points in the game. I watch the Mustangs, Jacqueline Jarnot here stealing the pass. She'll take it away for another MCA layup. Maranatha leads early. The legacy plays well. Jaden Nelson spins in the lane, scores, and is fouled. The Lions winners is just three games all season, lead by six at halftime. Early in the second half, ball comes to an open. Callie Weddle drains a three. Weddle with 13 in the game, and Legacy's lead grows to 12. 
But Maranatha rallies. Kayla Joe Davis banks in the jumper. And the Mustangs take the lead 39-38. Seventh grader Desiree Ware speeds from the backcourt all the way to the basket to lay in two more points. And Maranatha begins to take over. Jarnot has a big game. The junior with a three-pointer on her way to a 27-point night. Maranatha wins 73-57, wrapping up the MCAA title with the victory. Park Center's girls basketball team has an outstanding trio of seniors who are part of two state championship teams. On this week's Sports Jam show here on CCX, we profile Pirates center Michaela Hayes. Here's a clip from that story. Her main impact can often be found on the other end of the court as a rebounder and effective six foot three inch shot blocker. Michaela has seen her own game improve, but knows there is always room to grow. In college, I'm not going to be like a main five, so I had to expand my game out to the outside, like mid range, even threes a little bit, and like working on my handle. So just becoming a better player overall has been really important, just so I can be better as a player. And when I get down to college, I could be more versatile and be a better player to play against. Not only gifted with athletic talent, Michaela is a real student of the game as well. She'll watch our film, break down our film, but also watch college games, pro games, come back and ask questions. She's done it since she was a freshman. Um, though they're doing this, that's similar to what we're trying to do. Is this how it needs to look for us and um, that type of thing? And not only does it, she mimic her game after that type of stuff and it benefits her level of play, but also she helps everybody else understand that that's kind of what it's supposed to look like. You can watch the rest of the Michaela Hayes story and more on Sports Jam. It airs Wednesday evening at 6.30 and 9.30 on CCX channels 12 and 7.99, plus Thursday at 7 and 9.30 a.m. Alex and Mike, back to you. All right, thanks, John. Up next, a Brooklyn Park classroom turns into a barber shop. Now, why these kids received a new look when we come back. The art room doubled as a barber shop today at one elementary school in the Robbinsdale district. It feels like a new me and there you go. a new hairstyle, just clean. It's just like washing your hair, but just changing your hairstyle. This Northport Elementary fourth grader likes his new look. He and about a three dozen other students earned free haircuts for good behavior. It's a new program called Cuts for Character to reward the school's diverse student population in a culturally relevant way. Neighborhood barbers are invited in for the event, and parent volunteers do braiding as a way to build good community relationships. For a lot of our communities, going to the barber is there's a really strong bond between getting your hair done and that community person. And so it's a big deal when you go get your hair cut and you have that bond. And so we wanted to bring that connection into the school. A grant helps fund the haircutting event, and there will be two more like it this school year. And yes, parents do have to give their consent. So that does it for us. We will see you again tomorrow.